Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time it is that you have tuned into this. I thank you for tuning in to Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church Sunday School. We will be continuing to go through our look at books of the Bible in an, in an airplane view. And I'm going to try to make these Sunday schools a little shorter because the people who know tell me that uh, the average watch time is, is shorter than the average lesson time. So I'm going to make try and deal with that as best I can. So today, we want to look at the book of Ruth, which is an, an enigmatic kind of book. You wonder what it's all about when you first read it, because it's, it doesn't exactly seem to be a theological tome like Romans. Here's a picture for you to remember about the book of Ruth. And you see here two people, because it's a love story, so you see Cupid and you see the hearts. That will remind you that it's a love story. You see Ruth and Boaz sitting on the couch, uh, holding hands, in, in love with one another. And you, you can remember that it's the book of Ruth by looking at the picture, the top of the building, the roof is a book. So it's the book of Ruth, or the book of Ruth. So let's think a little bit about this book of Ruth. There are some who have said that the book of Ruth is almost a feminine version of the book of Job. Now, I think you may be pressing it a little bit there, but there are certainly characteristics in both books that are similar. People in desperate trouble, <clears throat> people who turn to God during that time of desperate trouble. And so Ruth, one of the things that Ruth is about is about treating those who are outsiders, outside our country, outside our belief system, outside what we know. Ruth was an outsider, and yet, at the end of the day, we realize that in Matthew 1, in the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ, there are only a few women mentioned, and one of them is Ruth, probably because she's an outsider, and she comes in. She was a Moabitess. So <clears throat> here's a little bit about the book of Ruth that you can sort of get a handle on to understand what the book is about. It's not a long book. It wouldn't take you a long time to read it. But nonetheless, just here, here we have some big ideas. First, Ruth and Esther are the only two books of the Bible named after women. We realize that the Bible was written during a patriarchal society. And some we, we cannot expect modern sensibilities to affect the history of the past. And so it was a patriarchal society. That's, we, we live with that. And Ruth and Esther show that God is not a patriarchal God, that he is indeed as concerned about both genders. So Ruth is that, along with Esther, which we'll get to in a, in a few weeks, and Esther is almost more troublesome in some ways than Ruth. Ruth is a sort of a female Job figure. We've, we've talked about that. Ruth begins with a famine and ends with the birth of a baby. That's sort of similar to Job. I mean, you don't want to press the details, but it's, it's, it's sort of similar to Job. And God is mentioned 25 times in the book of Ruth. Very unlike the book of Esther, which we will come to realize that God is not mentioned at all in the book of Esther. So, again, we want to think through this book of Ruth and ask ourselves, what exactly is going on here? The key verse for the book of Ruth is this book of, is this verse of sort of outsiders. This comes from, translation comes from the Net Bible. May the Lord reward your efforts. May your acts of kindness be repaid fully by the Lord God of Israel, from whom you have sought protection. So it is saying that because Ruth acted in a good way toward her mother-in-law, who was a, a member of the nation of Israel, that God is going to reward her for that. <clears throat> And God does indeed reward those who are kind to his people. Today, his people are those who have accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah. 
And God is kind to those who are kind to his people. Let's look quickly at an outline for the book of Ruth. This is, a, a, again, a very quick outline and overview. But it's just, in a sense, it's just what are the four chapters about? Realizing, of course, that when this was originally written, there weren't any chapters and verses. So, but here we have it. First, there's sorrow, Ruth weeping. You, you remember, if you remember the story at all, that Naomi is the mother-in-law. And Naomi tries to run away from her problems. And she tries to cover up her mistakes. And she gets bitter because God has taken her sons and she has nothing. She is a, a, a woman without a son or a husband in the ancient world was essentially reduced to begging at best. And so she is upset at God. And yet, despite the fact that Ruth is weeping in this first chapter for her mother-in-law, in the second chapter, things begin to turn around. Because in the second chapter, which is service, we find Ruth working. And we find a new beginning to faith. This Moabitess begins to hear about the God of Israel. And she finds a new friend and a new love and a new attitude of hope that is given to her. And then in the third chapter, it's the chapter of submission, Ruth waiting. And in this chapter, Ruth presents herself to the, the headmaster of the fields that, where she was, uh, and Ruth is, is presenting herself to Boaz. Ruth is accepted by Boaz, an, an amazing work of God's providence. And Ruth waits for Boaz to act. She doesn't take things into her own hands. At times, we, we tend to think that God has forgotten us and to grab things and take them into our own hands. But we want to wait for God. One of the great lessons of the book of Ruth and indeed of the entire scripture is that God is working even though we can't see him. So we want to be very, very careful about that. Wait for God. In the fourth and last chapter, there's satisfaction, and that is Ruth's wedding. Boaz redeems Ruth because Ruth had had a husband and there's this strange shoe covenant that takes place between someone called such and one and Boaz. And apparently this such and one had the right to marry Ruth, but they, Boaz redeems her. And to show that they are redeemed, they exchange shoes. It's, there are different kinds of covenants in the Old Testament. A covenant is sort of a contract. There's a salt covenant where each would exchange salt from bags that they wore around their neck. There's the shoe covenant in here in Luke, where I'm in Ruth, where they would uh, exchange shoes, and there's a, a blood covenant which we see in Abraham's day, and each of those covenants begins to get more and more serious. The blood covenant being the most serious because there's death involved, and so we see here that the people bless Ruth, and God gives Ruth and Boaz a son. And it's an amazing and exciting thing. It's because God gave Ruth and Boaz a son that in Matthew 1, one of the women, putting women in a, in a, new, in a uh, uh, genealogy at this period of time is in and of itself sort of out there. You didn't do that. But to put a foreign woman, a Moabitess woman, into the genealogy of our Lord is nothing short of amazing. And it's only because God gave Ruth and Boaz a son that that was able to happen. So let's look, as we always try to do, let's look at an unusual part of the book of Ruth, this sort of a questionable action. So what's happening here in chapter 3 is that Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, is saying to her, this is how you're going to be able to get, uh, you're going to be able to get this man, Boaz, to sort of go for you. It's like she's getting dressed up, going out to get the man that she really wants. So this is what uh, Naomi says to, to Ruth, bathe yourself, 
rub on some perfumed oil and get dressed up. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let the men, the man know you're there until he finishes his meal. And when he gets ready to go to sleep, take careful notice of the place where he lies down. Then go uncover his legs or the uncover his feet is the, is the actual text and lie down beside him and he will tell you what you should do. Now, that might grate a little bit against our 21st century sort of sensibilities that, that Ruth is being used as sort of a, a, a fishing moor, if you will, there. But there's more of a problem than that. And the problem is the word that's translated foot or leg can be used as a euphemism and is used as a euphemism many times, both in the Old Testament and in other places. It's used as, as a euphemism for sexual organs, either male or female. And so some have suggested that feet or legs, as we saw in that translation, functions in the same way here. That is, when Ruth lies down and uncovers his feet, she's actually uncovering something else. The, the sexual overtones are, are present in the action of a woman uncovering a man's legs in the dark of the night and lying down. There's no doubt about that. There's, there's, clearly there's something going on there. A woman does not go and lie down beside a man in the dark and uncover him in any way uh, and nuzzle up to him unless there's, she's interested in being his, his woman. And that's what happened. But I, I don't think that the author of the book of Ruth intended the explicitly sexual sense, uncover his genitals and lie down. I don't think that's what, what was meant there. You will find some commentators who will say that's exactly what was meant there. I'm not convinced that the evidence bears that out. You can do some more work on it on your own, sort of think through that. I think, though, that what it, it's, it's gentler than that. It's, it's, it's less obvious than that, what Ruth is doing. She is lying down beside him, uncovering his feet, perhaps so that his feet get cold and he wakes up and realizes that she is lying down there beside him. But for all of that, one of the great things that we can take away from this is that Ruth is a book about God's faithfulness to his people, even though they are outsiders. Even though Ruth was a Moabitess and not an Israelite, God was still faithful to her because she was faithful to her mother-in-law who was from Israel. And we ought to realize that God is faithful not just to us, but he's faithful to those that seem to be outside of us. And that's something for us to really think about as we sort through these issues that we're dealing with in, the, in our world today. So again, I'm going to try to keep these shorter because I know that there are a number of reasons. One is that you, you, most people are not trapped at home anymore with the COVID, and so they can get out and you don't have as much time to watch this. Second is the, the what what I've been able to learn about how long people are watching these. So next week, we will do 2 Samuel, or 1 Samuel, sorry, Ruth, 1 Samuel. So here you can see the picture. This is King Saul standing on a sand mule. So sand mule is uh, 1 Samuel. And you can tell the king is a Saul. The, the, Saul is a king because he has a, a king's crown on. But he also has a saw there to remind us that it's Saul. The book of Saul reminds us of a question. And the question is, what is success? And so I'll leave you with that question this week just to think through. What is success? There's a sense in which Saul was very successful. He was the king of Israel. He had a lot of money. He had a lot of power. He had virtually anything that he wanted. And yet, at the end of the day, Saul dies a, a horrible death. And his body is misused in a, in a horrible way. And we'll talk about that 
next week and we'll think about Saul and we'll think about both the life of Saul and the death of Saul. The death of Saul includes one of the most enigmatic pictures in all of Scripture, and that is Saul going to see a fortune teller or a medium or a psychic or a witch, whatever you want to call her. And that witch apparently brings up Samuel from the dead. So we'll talk about that next week. Think about it. What is success? How do you find success? And why in the world would God allow one of his prophets to be brought up by a psychic? I hope that you remember now the book of Ruth. I hope that you're excited about next week, and we will see you then. Thanks so much for watching Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church Sunday School.